Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's beautiful outside today, huh? Nice fall morning. Well, welcome to More Than the Score 2021. It's been an interesting year and a half, huh? How many people are, are really excited about being back in person? Yay. <laughs> me too, me too. I'm Althea Brooks and I'm Senior Director of Lifetime Learning in the University of Virginia's Office of Engagement. And it is indeed my pleasure to welcome you back uh, to More Than the Score again this year. Um, we partner with the Alumni Association to bring you more than the score before each home football games. And special thanks to our teams, both of our teams who are working all of these football weekends. So thank you, uh, Lifetime Learning, Office of Engagement, and Alumni Association. We extend a special welcome to our 2,000 plus uh, uh, folks online who have registered for this program today. Uh, and that's around the world. They've, they've registered from around the world. So welcome, we're glad you're here. We're thrilled to welcome Larry Sabato to More Than The Score. This is his 15th year of presenting to More Than The Score. It's, he's the only faculty that we invite back every year. And of course, he'll share a glimpse into his crystal ball uh, before the, the November election. The UVA Bookstore will sell Mr. Sabato's latest book. Um, he has pre-signed copies for you to uh, purchase today. And you all know, he says, these books make a very, very good Christmas gift. So <laughs> buy one, two, three for your friends. Uh, before we begin, please go ahead and silence the ringer on your phone. Silence your phones. We ask that you hold your questions to the end of the program. Uh, we've placed two mics, one here, one here, for you step up. Uh, and kindly uh, state your name and your UVA affiliation. And kindly only ask one question, one brief question. Uh, please keep on your mask while you're asking a question. We'll be able to hear you just fine. Now to introduce our speaker for the morning. Larry J. Sabato is a New York Times best-selling author who has won four, count them, one, two, three, four Emmys, and is recognized as is, the, is one of the nation's most respected political analysts. He appears multiple times a week on national inter and international television, including CNN, BBC, and CNN International. He is a Rhodes Scholar. Mr. Sabato is founder and director of the University of Virginia's Center for Politics and has, uh, been a vis has had visiting appointments in England at Oxford and Cambridge, U Cambridge Universities. Mrs. Sabato is the author or editor of two dozen books on American politics. He's the editor and lead author of the book, A Return to Normalcy, the 2020 election that almost, almost broke America. Uh, this book explores the 2020 election and its outcome. Again, this book has been pre-signed in the bookstores over here to sell them to you today. Mr. Sabato has taught over 20,000 students. Were you one of his students? Anyone here? I see a few hands. 20,000 students in his career, and the University of Virginia has given him its highest honor, the Thomas Jefferson Award. This year, 2021, Mr. Sabato celebrates his 51st year of association with the University of Virginia. I think that deserves an applause. Please help me thank and welcome Larry Sabato to more than the score. Yes, same thing, good. Well, good morning, and uh, let me first turn to Althea, who is celebrating her 30th anniversary working for the University of Virginia. It, she doesn't look old enough to have been here more than 10 years, but I'm, her mother is 90, so good genes, that's all I can say. But she does a wonderful job and has, I think, done all of these more than the scores, which have worked out, I think, over the years and give people a a chance to to uh, think before they cheer, and uh, 
And so we're happy to see all of you and uh, see you in person. We've been doing so many things virtually. I think everybody is sick of virtual presentations, but sometimes we have to do them. Uh, we actually had one I'm going to highly recommend to you. It has nothing to, well, it does have something to do with politics tangentially, but not directly. This past week, um, I can't remember what day it was, we had uh, uh, Senator, uh, former Senator Bill Nelson of uh, Florida, who is now the uh, director of NASA. He's the administrator at NASA. And Bill, you know, is a graduate of our, our School of Law and uh, has been loyal to the University of Virginia. He's grateful that he got to step up. He had an inferior uh, undergraduate education at Yale. <laughs> uh, so this, this restored him and gave him a very successful career. Just kidding, all those Yaleys out there. Just kidding, don't write me. I don't wanna hear from you. Um, anyway, it was, it was fascinating. It was one of the best interviews I've ever had with anybody. Not that I knew the subject, I didn't. I think that's why I enjoyed it so much because I, I just was trying to ask questions that, that anybody would ask. And, and he ventured into certain areas that I didn't expect, although he's political, so he talked about our relationship, space relationships with Russia, which are good, and our space relationships with China, which are awful. And uh, that was an interesting part of it. But the most interesting <laughs> were his comments on uh, parallel universes, something I've been interested in since Rod Serling focused on them so much in the Twilight Zone when some of us were young. And don't lie to me, you all remember the first run. <laughs> don't tell me you don't. I can look out there, at least the vast majority of you do. You two are too young. But uh, the vast majority of people here remember that. And he was, uh, Rod Serling once said it was because Albert Einstein said there were parallel universes. So he had a lot of shows on parallel universes. But he also talked about uh, something I'm sure you have seen or read about. There was a great segment on, on 60 Minutes, I don't know, a couple of months ago, I can't remember when it was, uh, about our fighter pilots for years and years, maybe decades, have been seeing these strange objects that have amazing abilities to fly and go under the sea and come back up. And, and you know, some people say they're artifacts of the machinery, but most of the people that, that I've read about or seen on, uh, on TV say that they're real. And of course the fear is that it's, a, it's one of our adversaries, um, and he talked about that. But the greater likelihood, at least this is the consensus of the people who follow this, is that it could very well be extraterrestrial. And it, he talked about this at some length. So it's on our website, centerforpolitics.org, uh, you, can, you can see it, and I think the university did a piece on it, UVA Daily, and there's a link at the bottom, and you can watch it. Uh, I'm just recommending it because I think a lot of you would be interested uh, in, that, in that subject. So I've tried to avoid entering the political realm for as long as I can, and now uh, we're going to talk about the, the subject that brings us all together, <laughs> that is so unifying. Uh, and uh, if the good thing about this screen is if there are parts of it I really don't want you to hear, I'm going to pretend that this is blocking, blocking my voice, which also works in class. Um, let's go ahead and, and start. Of course, the most important slide is always the first one. Uh, the, uh, can we get that up there? Am I doing this correctly? You'd think I'd know it after all these years. It's not working. Don't worry, I can filibuster. <laughs> I don't need graphs. I can, I can talk. There, well, you've got a special touch, Althea. That's all I can say. That's not the one that's important. It's this one. Uh, and uh, as I open up, I'll just leave that up here. I'll tell you one thing. I sure am glad we added the question mark because I don't, I don't think we're anywhere near normalcy, and I'm not just talking about COVID. I'm talking about politics and the way things are going. Um, and we can get into more of the specifics uh, in your questions if you want to, but it's pretty clear that uh, we as a country are continuing to divide and maybe even move further apart. Uh, we did, because we were concerned about this, we did a major project which is still ongoing with a group called Project Homefire, which is headed by a former PhD student of mine here. 
and uh, he's terrific and does uh, does fantastic survey research. Not these flash polls that that uh, can be right or wrong and have large margins of error. This was a very thorough, lengthy study of a thousand Trump voters and a thousand Biden voters to see what they really believed in and the layers of those beliefs and then their attitudes toward democracy and even maintaining the integrity of the United States. Uh, and, and as I said, it went on all summer and now we're releasing pieces of it in, in our crystal ball, which I hope you're all signed up for. It's all free. It comes We used to have it once a week, now it's about three times a week because there's so much to, to uh, report on, but you go to centerforpolitics.org and give us an email and you'll get these things uh, whenever we release them during the week. And they, they come out at, at least once every week and usually two or three times. Uh, I won't attempt to cover all of it. <clears throat> For one reason, it's too depressing. But uh, the other reason is it's just there's too much of it and it's, and it's the kind of detailed survey research that you never see in the newspapers, always with the flash polls or on, on TV. You know, they keep it cheap. And when you look into it, you can see why it's cheap and what the results are because it's cheap. But uh, this was a very extensive study. And I'll just, I'll just cite uh, one, uh, one finding and then, you know, if you want more, you can go, go to the website, website and catch up. Uh, but this, this bothered me more than anything else. A majority of Trump voters want the U.S in secession. They want the red states separated from the blue states in two completely separate countries. Now, that's shocking in and of itself. But what was equally shocking to me was that, while it's a lower figure, 41% of the Biden voters wanted secession. They want the red states to secede from the blue states and vice versa. And of course, it, it is a practical impossibility. It's not like 1860. And yes, you had you had uh, Union supporters in a lot of the southern states, at least the more northern southern states, like Virginia, and that's how we got West Virginia. But there were other places where uh, the Union was supported. And then in the north, you had plenty of places, Maryland and Delaware and so on, where um, you had lots of, uh, lots of supporters of, of southern secession. So the same problem existed, but less so, because it was sectional. And it was easier to divide the United States, thank goodness it didn't work, but divide the United States into, into two pieces. Today, what will we do? Uh, do, we, do we build the wall around all the blue places in, in red states and all the red uh, places in blue states? I mean, it's disturbing. And how strongly did they believe it? Well, a quarter of the Trump voters put it as one of their highest priorities one of their highest priorities. 18% uh, of the Biden voters put it as one of their highest priorities. This is, this is not good news. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe there's some people out there that support it, but I'd kind of like to see the United States stay together. You know, I really would. And uh, if you don't favor that, um, well, we can get you a ticket to Russia, it's no problem. <laughs> and if we don't like it, a ticket to China. Okay, so, but seriously, you know, this is disturbing. So you might want to take a look at that, and what you might ask, what's the point of the study other than to depress us? The point of the study, it was large enough so that we can divide uh, the Trump voters and the Biden voters into segments, not just the usual segments about gender and race and income and so on, but segments about views, perspectives on a wide range of issues and attitudes and values. And we're trying to see where we can stitch together pieces of the Biden coalition with pieces of the Trump coalition. Things that they have in common that they may not even think about or recognize right now. Uh, one concrete example, that's the appropriate adjective, is infrastructure. You know, they're all in favor of fixing the bridges because we all drive over them and don't want them to collapse. Uh, the roads and, and sewer systems and the water systems and everything that's, that's falling apart across the United States. Well, that is something to focus on. It's no accident that that was the, 
bipartisan piece of legislation, more or less, that's still sitting, waiting to be passed. There's a large majority awaiting its passage in the House, but of course it's been linked to this, the uh, Build Back Better uh, bill. I think eventually, I think eventually they'll get around to, uh, to uh, passing it. We'll see. Uh, I was more confident months ago, but I think they'll, I think they'll do it because for Democrats, uh, they have no choice. I mean, they can go ahead and concede the 2022 election now if they don't pass uh, these bills in some form. Obviously, it's not going to be 3.5 trillion for the BBB bill. It'll be, you know, whatever it is, one one and a half trillion or two trillion or somewhere in that vicinity, which is you know, still a lot of money. Remember, some of you, the older people here that I'm looking at, remember Everett Dirksen, the uh, very clever, <clears throat> very humorous kind of Bob Dole's predecessor. A minority leader in the U.S. Senate back in the 60s. And he had a saying he was fond of to tweak Linda Johnson in the Great Society. And he said, you know, a billion here, a billion there, and pretty soon you're talking about real money. And now it's a trillion here, a trillion there, and pretty soon you're talking about real money. So I guess nothing's changed but the amounts. Um, nonetheless, oh, I thought you were applauding. Feel free. <laughs> All of my senses are dulling. So that sounded like applause, and I'm desperate, you know. So that, that was fine. Okay. Um, anyway, let's get into this, and then we'll, we'll cover more of that as we go along. But just to remind you of the results, which was the uh, polar opposite of 2016 in terms of the electoral vote. Hillary Clinton got 232 last time, and now Donald Trump got 232, and that was, that was kind of amusing, I guess, in an ironic way. <clears throat> I hope nobody in here, being connected to the University of Virginia, and therefore highly intelligent, uh, actually believes anything that Donald Trump, well, probably anything he says at all, but particularly anything he says about election fraud. It is ridiculous. Ridiculous. That's my field. It's ridiculous. It's always been ridiculous. And this will shock you. It's about him. Who would have guessed that? It's about him. He can't accept the fact that he lost, but also he's looking to 2024 and how he can rig the system that he claims is rigged, even losing by 7 million votes. Uh, I don't know if you see a constitutional crisis coming, but I do. I don't know if you see potential violence and actual violence, maybe a plenty in our future, but I do. And at advanced ages, and again, don't lie to me. I just look around here, most of you, come on. Uh, we ought to be sounding the alarm. Probably most of us won't have to worry about it, or we'll worry about it in a parallel universe. Uh, but. The young people here, uh, and thank goodness there are two of them. I'm, I think they're in my class. Uh, you get extra credit. Don't worry about it. You can't do worse than a C now. That, I give you that guarantee. Don't you think? I mean, that's the, that's the floor. But I don't think there's a single student on the lawn that's even up yet. You know, they're targeted noon. They usually go to two. Now, how do I know that? Because I just look out my window and I see the number of bathrobes <laughs> at various hours. I, I know what the count is. Um, it's, it's up to us, even if we don't see it. We care about the country. Uh, we care about the next generations. Uh, and, and we have to sound the alarm. So that's why I tell you this. Now, I had a joke for years, which I still use, that, that there is a day on the calendar where the Electoral College will be abolished, and it's the 12th of never. Uh, and I hope that that is wrong. I hope it is. It's going to be extremely difficult to get it changed. I, I'm in favor of keeping it but modifying it to make it more representative of the popular vote. You know, it's the two senatorial bonus votes, uh, and also a lot of the small states that are Republican have a have one member of the House of Representatives, even though they don't have the population to support it if you were to apply the same population rules to them. You add all these advantages together and the fact that today, as I'm going to show you in a minute, 
all but six states are <laughs> really completely predictable if you have a competitive race. Uh, you know, we, we know the results for the vast majority of states before we even go into the election year. And, and that's not good for a country either. Competition is good for people wherever they are and whatever they're doing and whatever field they're in. Okay, this is the, the Senate results we already know, 50-50. Now the norm, because of what I just told you, the norm for the Senate is between 52 and 53 Republican seats. That's the norm. Over time, that's going to be the average based on the divisions that exist in America right now. The problem, if you consider it a problem for the country, and we are a federal country, but Democrats regularly will get far more popular votes than the Republicans, yet the norm will be they will control a majority of the Senate, which, by the way, is one, the only reason I can think of that's good to keep the filibuster, you know, to keep the 60-vote uh, level, because you do have to have some degree of bipartisanship to get big things passed unless you modify it, as they're talking about doing, uh, to get it down to 50 plus the vice president breaking ties, which I think is unwise usually. Now, you can argue about whether voting rights legislation ought to be the exception, or, but once you start making exceptions, then you guarantee that when the other party takes over, they'll broaden the exceptions to fit whatever their agenda is. And pretty soon, you won't have any, any need for any bipartisanship if one party has at least 50 seats plus the vice president. That's, I, that's not wise. I mean, it's just, we elected them, so we're, we're the ones responsible, but it's not wise to do that. It's wiser, given our divisions and the growing divide in the country, to try to stitch together a larger coalition if it's humanly possible. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's, we all know that map, and if you don't, you're, you're blissful. Uh, here's what I was going to show you. 22 states have two senators who are Democrats. 22 states have two senators who are Republicans. We only have six states that have one Democrat and one Republican. Decades ago, it would be easily 40% of the states, sometimes more. Because actually, at that time, it made sense. No matter who was in charge of the Senate, you'd have a voice in the caucus, the governing caucus, if you had a Democrat and a Republican. And the smaller states were very smart about that, you know, the Dakotas and places like that. They would make sure they had at least one member of each party from their very small delegation, Senate and, and House. Well, forget about that. The polarization, the partisan polarization, has meant that most people vote a straight party ticket. Maybe they make one tiny exception for their cousin running for sheriff, okay? Although even the cousin sometimes gets cut out, uh, depending on who the cousin is. Maybe they know him too well. They vote for the, for the other side. But it, again, it's useful to have people voting a little bit on both sides, if they can, in good conscience, uh, because it helps to bring us together. And they're cross-cutting loyalties then. You'll at least listen to both sides, even if you lean strongly toward one side rather than the other. So uh, does this ever get optimistic, uh, Althea? I don't know. I've forgotten what I put in here. Uh, anyway, the House is so close that, look, 2022, um, there essentially is five seats that would have to switch. <laughs> Depends on how many vacancies there are as to how many, uh, the margin for Democrats right now. but just redistricting reapportionment alone should give the Republicans enough to take over. And given the fact that it's a midterm in the middle of a Democratic presidency means the odds are very substantial that the Republicans will take over the House. Now, does that mean Kevin McCarthy's going to be Speaker? We'd have to call Mar-a-Lago. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. Trump has told people privately that he has real doubts about Kevin. My Kevin, remember, he used to say, my Kevin, uh, because Kevin McCarthy broke from him for 24 hours after January 6th. You don't ever do that to Donald Trump. Uh, memory like an elephant. He's a Republican. Memory like an elephant. And he's on the revenge tour anyway, which is going to last all the way through his next presidential campaign, assuming there is one, and he certainly 
strongly leaning in that direction for 2024. If he says somebody else has got to be speaker and suggests two or three names or maybe one, uh, Kevin McCarthy's got a big problem, big problem within the caucus, just getting nominated. His advantage is it's a secret ballot. So they can all come out and say, I voted for Trump's choice. There was fraud, it was fixed. That will be credible with Trump. You know, that's, that fills in, fills in just the way he would want it to. But I think it's very, very likely, unless great things happen for Biden, you know, COVID finally, uh, we're gonna have it like flu forever, but if we control it, I think people will be basically satisfied. Uh, and that will improve the economy, I think, in and of itself. It certainly will reduce inflation if we can get the transfer, the, uh, transfer problem solved and that uh, COVID, uh, the decline of COVID will help that and on and on. So you can imagine a situation that's positive, but you know, even presidents who have positive midterm ratings and positive midterm conditions tend to lose at least a few seats. And th this on top is redistricting uh, and reapportionment election 2022, the first one where they will all be reapportioned. You, you put all those things together and uh, you'd have to get great odds to vote that Democrats would, would keep the House if you were making a bet and you didn't want to just lose money if that wasn't your goal. Um, so that's the House. The, the reapportionment, I just put it up. Uh, this is how it's done in each state. Uh, the red states are controlled by Republicans, governor, both houses of the legislature. Uh, the uh, handful of blue states are controlled by Democrats. They have the trifecta, governor, both houses of the state legislature, and they don't have a nonpartisan commission. The states in yellow, and now Virginia's one, uh, and Colorado just switched too, are states with a some kind of, quote, nonpartisan commission. Well, as I always say, if you had kindergartners drawing the lines with crayons, they wouldn't know what they were doing, but it would still have political effects. Some incumbents would be thrown into the same district. Other incumbents would be given districts that are impossible for them to win and so on. So there's no such thing as a non-political reapportionment process or redistricting process. There can be systems that encourage uh, bipartisanship to a certain degree. I tend to favor, if you're gonna do it that way, get retired judges that are nominated by their fellow judges, both Democrats and Republicans, because of their reputation for fairness and honesty. That's it. Have you, have you been following those? How many of you are Virginians? Okay, well, the vast majority of you have been following the circus show uh, in Richmond. And I don't blame the members of the new commission, 16 members, eight Democrats and eight Republicans. And there has to be a supermajority to get anything passed. Guess what? It's totally deadlocked and it's over. It's over. And now it goes to the state Supreme Court. Democrats here will be very unhappy to know that there are only, there are only two nominal Democrats who are actually closer to the Republicans and the rest of them are all Republicans because the Republicans control the legislature for a long time and in Virginia, the legislature appoints the judges. Now, I happen to know a couple of them. I don't know, I don't know all of them, I've always, I fear them. You know, I don't want to appear before them. Uh, but the two that I know are, are pretty fair. I don't think, I think they will be fair-minded in the process. I can't speak for the others. But if you were a Democrat, you would have every right to be suspicious you know, because they're gonna draw the lines in private. There's no requirement for open session, no requirement for public hearings. That was all supposed to take place in the commission. And the commission was built to fail. Why was it built to fail? Because Democrats had a narrow majority in both houses. And if they had stuck together, they could have redistricted Virginia, the congressional districts and the House of Delegates and state Senate districts, which is exactly what the Republicans would have done had they maintained their majority throughout the Trump term, and they didn't. Democrats won a majority. Uh, so the, the Republicans saw this was the way to maintain their influence, to get it up to the state Supreme Court, which is overwhelmingly Republican. It worked like a charm, but it only worked because just enough Democrats in the House and Senate were dumb 
dumb, dumb, and voted for it. They voted for it because it sounded good. And there we have it. Colorado did the same thing. And now their uh, redistricting of their congressional districts, which is the only one I've seen, I don't know about the state legislature there, uh, basically Democrats have, have lost a couple of districts they would have won had the legislature redistricted Colorado. So Democrats fall for this all the time. And I do give the Republicans credit. They don't fall for it. They figure out what's in their interests and they do it. They do it. Uh, so there you go. And that's another reason why I think Democrats are behind the eight ball uh, for next year in the House. Okay, Biden's first year. And I'll, I'll run through these last ones so we can get your questions. Uh, the red line is disapproval. The blue line is approval. And we were using uh, polling averages there. And you can see, oh, around somewhere in early August, uh, the lines crossed and disapproval went over approval and it's been maintained. It's relatively close. That is, it depends on which polls you're looking at. That's why you use polling averages, but I'm not sure I even trust polling averages anymore. But you've got a cluster of polls that have Biden between 37 and 41 approval. You have a cluster of polls that have Biden between 40, 46, 47, and 50. The, uh, you, you round them out, it's, you know, 43, 44, 45, depending on which polls you, you trust enough to put them in the polling average. So he's already underwater. Now, that's, it's not horribly unusual for new presidents, but they usually last in the positive range longer than this. But we live in a very partisan, divisive age. I, I, I don't believe, at least in my lifetime, which saves me since it's not all that long, uh, I don't think that we will have another president, like those of us who are older remember, when a new president was elected, upper 50s, lower 60s, up to 70, up to 80, supporting the president at first. Of course it fell off, but once you start there, it takes a long time to get below 50, because Americans were more united, and they said, let's give this new president a chance. You know, where our interests are tied up with his performance. Let's give, it, give him a chance. Let's support him. Give him a chance. That's gone. Absolutely gone. 90% uh, of Republicans, approximately, sometimes it's 88, sometimes it's 94, approximately 90% of Republicans have opposed Biden from the get-go. And it has to be said, 90% of Democrats or more have supported him from the get-go. Uh, so the division is there. It's, it's maintained consistently, and that means Basically, a president eventually reverts to whatever percentage of the vote he got. Trump, the polls were always low for Trump because Trump voters, as we learned in the 2016 and 2020 election, would not participate in many of the polls. They, they just didn't answer the phone or they hung up or whatever. They didn't trust them. Maybe it's because they were from the, quote, fake news media, whatever the heck it was. Uh, but they wouldn't even participate in Fox polls. Fox had the same problem. <laughs> getting people, getting Trump voters to participate in their polls. So there's tremendous suspicion out there. Uh, but Trump never really varied all that much from the 46% he got in 2016 or the 47% he got in, in 2020. It was maintained pretty evenly. And I think the same thing will happen to Biden over time. But it just means he has no capital to spend. He spent it partly because the margins are so tight in both houses of Congress. He's not a magician, and he can't hypnotize uh, cinema in Arizona and Manchin in West Virginia to support what all the other Democrats support. Can't be done. And Manchin in particular is representing a state. That was one of Trump's two best states, that in Wyoming. You know, when you got 70% on the other side and you hope to be reelected and you're a Democrat in a Republican state like that, guess what? You make lots of choices that other Democrats don't agree with. So, I mean, I get it. I get why these things are happening. There was nothing he could do about it once the election was over. But presidents are blamed for the conditions that exist. Whether they created them or not, that's always been the deal. You may say, boy, that's an unfair deal. Well, I balance that with the joys of being president. <laughs> okay? So, you know. 
Well, you take the good with the bad, and there's plenty of good and plenty of bad, okay? Uh, that's the reality. Now, the midterm next year, the blue line is presidential election turnout. See how high it is? And we've gotten a lot better with turnout. Problem is, it's generated by hope and fear, not by, certainly not by love or optimism. It's hate and fear. People are angry, and when they're angry, they show up. And when they're happy, they do other things on election day, or now election month, or election season, or whatever it is. The bottom line is midterm turnout. And again, <laughs> that, that line going up, that was almost all Democrats. And there was one cause, two words, Donald Trump. Okay, that's why it went up. I kind of think it's going to go back down somewhat, but it'll be higher than the average, which has been like 38 to 40 percent since World War II, which is awful, by the way. It's awful. It's terrible. But we're now better than terrible. That's how that, hey, I just said something optimistic. <laughs> we're better than terrible. I'm, I don't want to hear anybody whine, okay, after it's over. Uh, our Senate projections, look, <laughs> if things are anything like they are today, uh, I think we'll have an early night, and it will be a Republican House and a Republican Senate. If things get substantially better, then the Democrats have a shot at retaining the Senate. Notice I didn't mention the House. They have a shot at retaining the Senate. Now, if they retain it, it'll probably be 50-50 again. The most they could hope for would be 51-49, whereas Republicans, you can easily see them moving up 53, 47, something like that, which I told you was the norm. And, you know, as usual, Pennsylvania <laughs> is totally uh, a toss-up, it almost always is now. In North Carolina, it's an open seat, but I think it'll go Republican in the end. Wisconsin, uh, it may be an open seat if the incumbent Ron Johnson retires, but I think in the end it will go Republican, particularly if Johnson doesn't run. Um, and, you know, Georgia, that's light blue. I, if things continue this bad, uh-uh. Uh, Nevada, same way. It's a closely competitive state, leaning Democratic, but not in years that are bad for Democrats. And Arizona, I think Mark Kelly will hang on, the new Democratic senator from there, who was an astronaut. You know, That's worth two points, according to several studies. It is, it's worth two points to be an astronaut. So I guess William Shatner can get elected to the Senate. <laughs> I don't know what state he'd run from, but uh, maybe that's why he did it, who knows? So you know, it's gonna be close, the Senate's gonna be close, that's why the 60 matters, but they may do carve-outs, and then there's Katie bar the door. Governor's races, we're not going to talk about those. There's so many of them. I mean, there are 36 next year, and uh, there are just too many to talk about. And, you know, Georgia will be a toss-up, mainly because Trump wants to oust the incumbent Republican governor and has encouraged people to vote for the Democrat if, if the Republican is the nominee, Brian Kemp, because, of course, he didn't find those whatever it was, 11,000 votes. Just go find them. I only need 11,000. You can find those votes, remember? Uh, the phone call to the Secretary of State in Georgia. Um, okay, you just go find those votes. Uh, Arizona, again, it's, it's a state in transition, but it goes back and forth, it wobbles. Kansas, I can't believe a Democrat will be elected twice. She won the first time because Republicans nominated a nut, and she barely won then, so, you know. It's, things go back to stasis, whatever they are. Wisconsin's very close. So, you know, it, it's way too early, but probably Republicans will pick up a few. Okay, now, quickly, 2024, uh, so we can get to questions. Everybody, this is, of course, ridiculous to even talk about, but I do it because you won't remember. Uh, I'm, I'm counting on that, and, and I know very well that people my age won't remember, unless you're taking supplements and they're dangerous. Nobody knows whether Biden is going to run for re-election or Trump will actually pull the trigger and run in the end. Every indication we have now, three years, or maybe two years before the announcement, is that they're both running. Now, you know, things change from day to day and health problems occur and you just, you just never know. In Biden's case, I tell people, well, he, he's going to be, he will be 82. I think, somewhere in that vicinity, by the end of the first term, which means he will be 86 
at the end of the second term. It gives me hope. You know, I mean, that was a joke. <laughs> the older people should have laughed. My fellow senior citizens, don't you hate it when you're called elderly? I've been protesting that on Twitter every time I see it. I get angry and I, I use lots of exclamation points in all caps. And then it gets retweeted a million times, you know, because that's how people treat Twitter. Uh, but, you know, that's pushing it, <laughs> really. That's pu I know, you know, they take care of things in the White House, and, but you know, the best nutrition in the world won't necessarily help you um, to 86. You have to make it on your own. You have to have good genes and all the rest of it. So it just seems to me improbable. And yet, there's only one person, and three different people in the White House who are well-connected have told me this independently and without my asking. The only person who can or will talk him out of running is Jill Biden, period, because he wants to run. And you say, well, that's crazy. No, think of it this way. He has been running for president since the 60s. <laughs> this was his third national campaign. He finally won. I mean, he was thrilled as anybody would be. Do you think voluntarily he's going to give that up unless he's ill or he sees that there's no path to victory? He wouldn't want to go out a loser, right? Now, what about Trump? Well, uh, he's younger. He's four years younger than Biden, <laughs> but he'll be 78 in, in uh, 2024, you know, which is also pushing it. Uh, particularly if you eat three Big Macs a day, you know, I'm sure there are doctors out here. I got to tell you one anecdote that's fun. I can't tell them. I can't tell them this anecdote. She was saying no. And I always looked at Althea. She has excellent judgment. This, I know everybody out here, or at least a lot of you, have a view on Biden's health. Because I get loads of emails and tweets about it and questions about it. Well, I'm going to go back to 2016. This was not in Charlottesville. I, was, I flew to another place. I was giving a talk to a doctor's convention. <clears throat> and I got there early because the plane, incredibly, was early. We'll never go back to that. Uh, so I got there, and, you know, there are hundreds of doctors there. And they're milling about, and so, you know, we talked politics. What a shock. And one right after the other pulled me aside and said, I don't want my colleagues to hear, but you do realize that Hillary Clinton has a fatal disease. She will not last three months, six months, one year, one and a half year. Everybody had a different estimate. Well, what does she have? I don't have enough time to tell you how many illnesses she had. I said, well, how do you know these things? I can see it in her TV broadcasts. So I tell you what I decided to do right then, and I've done it. Instead of paying an enormous fee for my doctor's visits, I send them a videotape <laughs> and ask for a quick analysis. How do I look? Everything okay? If I'm ill, what do I got? I mean, it, even well-trained professionals can be crazy. <laughs> so anyway, I, I have no, no uh, desire to diagnose Biden and no desire to diagnose Trump. If Trump thinks he can win, he will run, assuming his health permits. He will run, no question about it. If he thinks he might lose, remember, he doesn't want to go out a loser because he's already run, won twice in his own mind, right? He doesn't want to end a loser. So he'll find a reason not to run. He'll, pro he'll certainly endorse maybe one, maybe two, maybe three candidates. He wants that person indebted to him. Uh, if, if Biden and Trump don't run, then you, then you get to the others because I don't think anybody is going to successfully challenge uh, Trump. Some of the Pence people, one in particular, who's visited me, <laughs> insists that Pence is going to run regardless. And, of course, after January 6th, he's not going to get Trump's support anyway. So might as well, you know, might as well. And somebody will run to make the case, you know, I don't think Nikki Haley will in the end, and she won't win if she does, probably. And Ron DeSantis is not going to challenge Trump. They're all positioning, hoping he'll step aside. Uh, and there are tons of Chris Christie is going to run and lose. He's not going to get the nomination. Good God. Um, Democrats don't make the mistake of thinking if Biden steps aside that Vice President Harris is, will automatically inherit the nomination. She will not. She will have a major battle. I'm not sure who will run, how many will run. Uh, there have been reports just in the last week that 
first that Pete Buttigieg was meeting with big donors who were encouraging him to run. And then that didn't sell well. And so the news story that came out, I don't know which one's true, is that the donors met independently and decided he should run. And uh, he was shocked to hear the results, you know. Uh, I don't know. I have, I have no idea uh, whether that's true. Cory Booker would love to run. He would jump in. Others, just look at the cast of characters in 2020 who didn't get the nomination. They'll all run. So, you know, it's a cast of thousands, and we'll wait and see. And truthfully, assuming that you are going to buy the book and that you're going to sign up for Sabato's Crystal Ball and that you're going to watch Bill Nelson, if you do all three of those things, I'm looking forward to your questions. If you're not going to do those three things, don't even bother. <laughs> Just keep your damn hand down. He who lives by the crystal ball ends up eating ground glass. Now, how do you want to work the questions? There are two, oh, very good, and they're appropriate for the pandemic. <clears throat> Where? <clears throat> okay, hey. Hi. Hey, can you tell me who you are and what your connection is? Hey, yeah. Uh, Mason Montgomery, School of Data Science, class of 2016. Oh, God. Yep. <laughs> so young. Real, I resent them. I really do. Uh, I resent them. It was okay. good to hear that. So uh, my question is, do you think that Democrats are making a mistake in trying to hang the big lie around Republican necks? Like, is that going to more likely, you know, push independent and moderate or undecided voters away from Republicans when they you know, talk about that nonsense? Or is that just going to radicalize anyone who comes there for any reason? OK. Uh, <clears throat> the big lie is used by Democrats for one reason, to motivate Democrats. OK? Democrats are motivated when Donald Trump's running. The question is, will they come out in large numbers when he's not president? Now, if he's reelected in 2024, I would predict flatly Democratic turnouts would skyrocket for four years. But when he's not in, can you get them to come? Well, one way you can get them to come is to remind them that the big lie exists and the big liar, from their point of view, could be in office again if they start putting Republicans back in charge, particularly of Secretary of State positions. The Trump people have got nine candidates scattered around the country in the swing states to be Secretary of State. Why are they even important? Because they're the ones who run elections. And they will be the ones who either certify or don't the election of 2024. And then it will be tossed into the state legislature where they will, they will judge the popular vote as being real or fraudulent. And if it's a Republican state legislature, uh, in some cases, I think we can guess right now what they will do. And under the Constitution, this is in the Constitution, they can appoint their own slate of electors. They could ignore the popular vote, because when, when the Constitution was written, there was no popular vote. We didn't have a popular vote for president, and it was tiny, until 1824. All right, so the founders weren't thinking about the popular vote. They can appoint their own electors. Gee, I wonder who those electors will be for. Who could it be? Anyway, I've gotten off the track, but it's important to think about these things before they happen. We wait for disasters to happen, then we try and fix it. It's so much easier to prevent disasters, but we don't do that. We're human beings. Uh, so the big lies used to stir Democrats and get them out to vote. Okay, and I, that's it. And remember, we don't have a big group of independents. It's a tiny percentage in any election, and half of them don't vote. They're, they're actually what was once called, and I apologize for the term, but it's been in print for years, the dregs of the electorate. They don't keep up with politics. They're not interested in politics. They don't vote. So you're talking about a few percent of independents, and they almost always split. You, at most, it'll be like 60, 40, or 65, 35. So you're not going to be shut out among independents regardless. That's the, that's the strategy. It's reasonable. It may or may not work in any given circumstance, but you can see why they use it. Okay? Very good. Go out and do great things, make a fortune, and endow the Center for Politics. I'll try. That's my advice to everybody. Everybody. And I know a lot of you older people, you've got estates. You have got estates. And you know, the kids just waste it. They just waste it. Why not name something after yourself? That's just a suggestion. Take it for what it's worth. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Althea, and uh, thanks, Larry, for these uh, 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 talks. We always appreciate it. Mark Bruner, a proud dad of a 22 undergraduate who, Caroline Bruner. Uh, my question for next, you. Next May. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, That's let's right. hope it's in person. We're hoping. Me too. Um, my question is governor's race. Uh, it feels to me a lot like 2014 right now. Uh, 2014, you had Ed Gillespie, who was successfully portrayed himself as a moderate Chamber of Commerce Republican, almost upset uh, uh, popular Senator Mark Warner. I feel like uh, Glenn Youngkin has done a very good job uh, casting himself in that same mold, but wanted to get your insight into what we will uh, see uh, November uh, first week. Yeah, well, and I thought at first you were mixing up the years. I thought you were referring to 2017 when Gillespie ran for governor and lost by nine points after the polls showed it essentially tied, uh, which was a commentary on the polls. But it was also a commentary on Donald Trump. He's the one that brought Democrats out in record numbers. Who's president now? Not Donald Trump. Um, look, uh, it's a very competitive race. It's close and competitive. We're watching it day, day to day. We got the background surveys, and I'll, I'll tell you, uh, these, I, I don't want to tell too much because I don't want to burn my sources, but they're, they're the real background polls, and the Republicans have Yunkin up several points, and the Democrats have McAuliffe up several points. Now, the fact that it's even that close or tied tells you that it is not a successful year for Democrats. This is Virginia. There are far more Democrats than there are Republicans now. But every election is decided by those who show up. And the enthusiasm level for Republicans is through the roof. Democrats are saying, and I've heard this, drives me nuts. I'm tired. We've had a tough four years. I'm going to take this year off. <laughs> no, I'm serious. And, uh, you know, it's not just minority voters either. It's a lot of people who should know better and should vote. Regardless of your, who your votes cast for, you should be participating. Uh, so if, if this continues, then Youngkin would win, in my view, because the momentum is his. What could change the momentum? Well, the two things that I'm looking at, three things. I'm looking at Washington to see if the Democratic clown car can organize themselves without resorting to parading by the cameras and reach a compromise and pass it, both of them, in some form, all right? That alone will lift Biden a few points in the polls. And as Biden goes, so goes Trump, uh, McAuliffe. McAuliffe would go up if Biden did, because this is, this is a Democratic state, so plus five or six Democratic state. Yes, Biden won by 10, but that's because the numbers were exaggerated by a lot of moderate Republicans and independents who just couldn't take Trump anymore. That's what it was. Uh, and that's, that's gone, at least it's not on their television screens every night. So I'm looking, that's one thing. And you know, miracles happen. <laughs> I don't, I don't know, you know, they keep saying we're almost there, we're almost there, and uh, we're all at the point where we believe it when we see it, and don't bother us until you pass something. We're, you know, tired of hearing it. The second factor is, <clears throat> notice Youngkin has brought almost nobody into the state, and he presents that, as he should, as a virtue. I'm running myself. I'm running because I'm going to be governor. I don't want anybody else coming in and influencing people. The reason he hasn't invited anybody in is because there is nobody. He's not going to invite Trump. Trump wanted to come, by the way. Uh, but his, the, the Yonkin people have done something very smart. A fair number of people, around a dozen, in Yonkin's operation worked for Trump, either in the White House or his campaigns or both. And they keep in very close touch with Mar-a-Lago or whatever golf course he's at. Uh, and they've kept him on board, at least to the extent that he still says good things, but he's not picking some site in Virginia to plop down in during the campaign and not saying anything negative about Youngkin, who's tried to put some distance between him since he got the nomination. 
before he got the nomination in May, uh, you know, he and uh, Trump were blood brothers. And now, Donald who? Uh, remind me how to spell that, you know, that kind of thing. And it's reasonable. That's what you would do if you were a candidate. And you say, well, that's not honest. Oh, boy, you haven't been around politics very long, have you? Uh, so that's the second thing that I'm looking at. McAuliffe is bringing in Biden, but only in Arlington. Now, they say it's the convenience of the president. Yeah, okay. But it's also because he can't do a lot of damage in Arlington. Where his ratings are still high in Arlington. It's Obama that's appearing. Oh, it's today. It's today. I chose you over that. That's how much I love you. I just, I just throwing that out there. Uh, Obama and you know Stacey Abrams has been here, and Jill Biden, and I don't know who else is. is oh, uh, Dave, Matt, if you're in Charlottesville on Sunday, uh, tomorrow, I'm mixing up my days. You can try and go to the free day. I think it's free. Dave Matthews concert downtown. It's free at the Tink Pavilion right here now problem for some of you is it's to celebrate or, or to endorse, I guess, McAuliffe. Uh, but it's a free concert. So, you know, if you turn up a little late, then you can just listen to the music. Um, so, you know, he's, he's doing this with lots and lots of people. And that could have some effect in connecting with Democrats at the end. And then the third thing, <laughs> and this is wild, you know, the Supreme Court follows the election returns. Remember that old phrase? The Supreme Court follows the election returns. Maybe they do. But one thing they don't follow, apparently, is the election calendar. Because this six to three conservative Republican court chose November 1st, the day before the election, to hear the arguments about the Texas abortion bill. That's going to be the banner headline on November 1st and also the morning of November 2nd. And you say, well, that will motivate lots of pro-life voters for Youngkin. No, they've been motivated. The turnouts, zoom. It's the Democrats who are pro-choice on abortion who are tired. They're so tired. And they may get energized when they see, when they're reminded that what they regard as Reproductive rights will be potentially eliminated one way or the other. There are several cases coming up, probably the Mississippi cases, the one most uh, damaging. But it does matter what the last headline is for the people who haven't decided to vote, not haven't decided who to vote for. The vast majority know who they're going to vote for. If they vote, it's about turnout. Uh, so that is interesting. I mean, did anybody tell them the election was November 2nd? I mean, they are in Washington. It's right next to Virginia. Uh, but it, it's going to have some impact, and it favors disproportionately. It favors McCollum. So you see what I mean? There are still things you have to watch in a close, competitive, quote, tied race. It's not going to be tied in the end. It's a close, competitive race. So that's, that's my answer. Have I confused you enough? That was terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much. I love confusing people. I'm not giving brief answers. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Sabato. I'm a retired surgical faculty in the, in the um, School of Medicine. How do I look? <laughs> <laughs> We're several beers away from that uh, <laughs> evaluation. I, I wasn't overly offended by your crack about doctors, but here we go. Overly. <laughs> okay. Uh, you look good. Um, your take on the congressional interest or possible regulation of social media and the messages that they were putting out during the past election. Well, we, we've got to stop misinformation. Just absolutely have to stop all the phony stuff that's, that's out there. And there's tons of it, whether it's COVID, or an election, or fill in the blank, whatever subject there is. And it, it's just remarkable to me, we are decades into social media, and there are still millions and millions of people who don't realize just because something is on the internet doesn't make it true. You have to check these things out, but they don't. And part of it is, uh, and I saw it just this morning, you know, uh, Biden, or somebody, maybe it's the National Archives, 
delayed for the millionth time the release of the remaining documents about the JFK assassination. This was all supposed to be out years and years and years ago. Uh, and you should have seen in my feed, they're hiding the fact that the Soviets did it. They won't tell you that it was the Chinese. They don't understand the mafia did the whole thing. One right after the other, you know. I mean, that, that grassy knoll was crowded. <laughs> my God, there were so many people there. But see, that's, and they've read it all on the internet. And a lot of them cite various uh, uh, passages from the internet that they read on some website. And, you know, the, and the assassin of Kennedy killed Dorothy Kilgallen which about 10 of you remember. She was a panelist on What's My Line and a newspaper columnist. What in the world? Huh? What? Huh? Tell me that again. But it's, it, that's what happens because it's more appealing. It, it appeals to a side of us that likes to be thrilled and thinks that you know, life could make sense if we believe in this conspiracy theory and that conspiracy theory. So uh, it's tough to do. And also, who do you have deciding? You know, what's misinformation and what isn't? And you could say, well, you put a panel together of people from all different perspectives. Good luck with that one. Then, then there'll be no decisions at all, just like this redistricting commission. So I don't know what to tell you. I, I want them to do a better job, and they did a better job in 2020 than they did in 2016. That's for sure. But there were still lots of problems, and there probably always will be. There are millions of inputs and of just Facebook every day. How do, you, how do you cover all that stuff? I mean, you use artificial intelligence, but even that can't do anything approaching a perfect job. Now, that was brief. No, it was. No. <laughs> I speak in 50-minute intervals, right? 50-minute intervals. Thank you. Okay, well, well, thanks very much for the last question. I'm Ed Hartney. My daughter goes to school here. Wonderful. And my question is, given the threats to democracy and the... Uh, Trump's retaliation, you know, threats of retaliation, is there any chance that uh, Senate, well, the Republican establishment will break with him at any point? Break with Trump? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if there's another dangerous insurrection, they will break with him for 24 hours. They, they've got a clock in the Senate. And for 24 hours, they will condemn Trump and everything he's done. I'm sorry, it's, it's gone. You've got a few who semi-broke with him and did vote for impeachment, a handful. Uh, and, and I respect the fact that they did it. The one I respect is uh, the uh, senator from Louisiana. I, I'm just convinced he must not be running for re-election because in Louisiana, you know, he is, it's like he burned the Bible. Uh, so in Mitt Romney, I mean, Utah, well, Utah actually is never like Trump. Trump, you know, normally they give 70, 75 percent of the vote to the Republican nominee for president. In 2016, Trump didn't even get a majority of the vote. He edged out Clinton, but there was an independent running from Utah that got what was called the moral Republican vote. Uh, you know, so, so anyway, the point is, how did you get me off on that track? That really, <laughs> they're trying to keep it short. The two I really respect, and I'm not, I'm not allowed to endorse, I'm not allowed to give contributions, but being so close to the end, I am thinking that I will give money anyway to Liz Cheney yes. and Adam Kinzinger. Uh, you know, it's, it's easy for a Democrat to come out and, you know, blast uh, Trump or blast January 6th or whatever. They, at least Kinzinger, has sacrificed his career, and Cheney will have a hell of a time just getting reelected to her House seat, and her future is over in the Republican Party. It's over. She's already lost her leadership position in the House. You know, I look for people who make real sacrifices, all right? I always tell people, JFK's book, Profiles and Courage, very thin volume. There aren't many. And when you find one or two or ten, you should celebrate them. And those are two that I celebrate. And on that note of positive, upbeat celebration. <laughs> Wonderful to see you all again. Stay safe, and we'll see you again next year. Thank you all for coming, and we, we had over 2,000 people sign up for the live stream, so we're, we're getting out there. At least um, 200 actually <laughs> tuned in. At least 200.
Well, on behalf of Lifetime Learning and the Alumni Association, we have a small gift for you. Thank you so much. Not a tie. Thank you. Oh, it's, heavy. <laughs> it's more liquor. Yes. <laughs> I use it every day. It's really good for you. And the bookstore is over here. We've got some books signed by Larry, so stop by. Enjoy the game. <laughs>